So our next speaker is Max Soiner. Uh, he will talk about uh, formalization of affine schemes in cubic lambda. Oh, thank you. Uh, wait, let me try this. Oh yeah, perfect. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about an ongoing formalization project that is joint work with my supervisor Anders Madbel, and no, oh, which. Uh, well, I'll do it here. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, it's okay. I can I can use it. Thanks. Um, yeah. So the idea is to uh, formalize a constructive appro approach to a fine schemes, or you might call it a point-free approach. And the goal is to uh, construct two things. Firstly, the so-called Zariski lattice, which I'll denote ZL, and I have a little underscore R here, uh, uh, there, uh, indicating that we work over a fixed commutative ring. And then once we have uh, the Zariski lattice, we want to construct the so-called structure sheaf on the Zariski lattice. So I'm not going to talk about what a sheaf is too much. Uh, it doesn't matter, really. But uh, basically, the structure sheaf is this O, and it's a it's a pre sheaf. Uh, so going from Z L up, so Z L is a lattice has an order relation, so it is a post set category into commutative rings, and uh, so this is the main difference from a classical approach. Um, classically, we define a topology on the set of prime ideals of our ring R, and then the, the open sets they form the Zariski lattice. Constructively, we look at finitely generated ideals of our ring, and then we quotient by this equality that two such finitely generated ideals are equal if their radicals are equal. And uh, I'm, yeah, I'm not going to tell you what radicals are. Also, doesn't matter. Um, maybe you still remember from your commutative algebra class. Um, so here's a disclaimer. Uh, this, this constructive approach is not due to us. Um, the first description of, uh, or point-free description of ZL is due to André Joyal. Well, that was back in the 70s. Um, this more concrete implementation, if you will, and the one we're using that you can find in the cubicle actor library is, uh, can be found in a paper by Espanol. And otherwise, so this, this whole construction of the structure sheaf and more stuff has been described in a paper by Coquin, Lombardier, and Schuster, and this is what we follow in, in our project, mostly. So also, I should say that we're not the first to do fine schemes or schemes. There's existing work in a lot of proof assistant. Some of it has been written up in form of papers. Others exist as pull requests in various math libraries, so there is an there's a formalization in Koch, which was, goes, which was done back in 2001 using setoids. Uh, then there is the schemes in lean paper, which I think is very interesting uh, to read because they sort of describe the journey of how they failed or have a, an attempt that was not working so well and then finally fixed all the issues. So uh, it's, a, yeah, it's a very pleasant read. And, uh, and there's also work in Isabel Hall, so in particular they can do schemes without dependent types, and there is already univalent form, uh, in formalization in univalent proof assistant in Unimath. Um, but what should be said is that all of this work uh, uses a different approach from what we use, uh, and that's what I call the Hartshorn approach, because that's the approach that's taken in this classical algebraic geometry book by Robin Hartshorn. Um, and this one is inherently non-constructive. Um, it uses choice in a crucial way. Um, so this is not really an option for us. What we want to do is uh, formalize a constructive approach. And because we're working in cubicle agda, we, we expect to get some crucial help from univalence. We expect univalence to make our life easier. Um, so here's, here's a slide about cubicle agda and why it's great. Uh, especially for our purpose. First of all, we have path types um, and we have dependent paths. So this makes it very easy, uh, very convenient to, to write transports of properties of complicated objects. Um, so 
yeah, the, when you when if you're interested in our code, you'll see that uh, this actually plays a crucial part in making our life easier. Uh, then we have higher inductive type, and what we are interested in is that this gives us set quotients. So you've seen that the Zariski lattice is a set quotient uh, constructively, and uh, there's another uh, there's so-called localizations of rings. Uh, so those are like rings of fraction. Uh, I'll talk a bit about them uh, later. And those are also set quotient, much like you get the rationals as a quotient of pairs of integers. And we have univalence, and with that, a structure identity principle for the various algebraic structures that can be found in the library. So we have a particular for commutative rings, we have a function which I call SIP here, it takes two commutative rings, an isomorphism of rings between them, and spits out a path. Um, and I think this cannot be stressed enough, everything computes, everything has computational meaning. Um, so all in all, I would say this is a great foundation to, to do constructive univalent mathematics on a set level basis. So we're not interested in any higher stuff, but uh, already on a set level, this, this is very nice <coughs> to work with. And I think this is pretty much in the spirit of Vovotsky's foundational library. So he did, for example, localizations. In a sense, we're extending that work. Um, so this is what we do. Uh, we define the structure sheaf by defining what it does on generators first. And the Zariski lattice is generated by these elements d, f, where f is an element in our ring. And the idea is we send such an d, f to the localization of r at f. So what is d of f? Well, classically, it's an open set, and it's a generator of the so-called Zariski topology. It's a set of all prime ideals that do not contain f. Constructively, uh, it's an equivalence class of finally generated ideals, and it will be the equivalence class of the principal ideal generated by f. And then r of f is the ring of fractions of the form r over f to the n, so fractions where the uh, denominator is the power of f. This can be seen as the ring where we add uh, an in, we, we make f invertible um, in this ring. And what we have to do, of course, is check that this is well defined, that this gives us a function. So if d of f equals d of g, then r localized at f should be r localized at g. Problem is that sort of this can be true even if f and g are different elements in your ring. So it can be it can happen that you have two different f and g but sort of their ideals land in the same equivalence class here and uh yeah somehow we still have to produce a path here and and then there's of course more which is currently work in progress as far as formalization goes uh, so we have to prove that this is a sheaf of course and we have to show that we can extend this to the whole lattice and still get the sheaf property so now, the question is, uh, where does univalence come into play? Well, maybe you've already guessed it at the last slide. Uh, sort of this path we can't get without univalence. Um, we can prove them isomorphic if this holds. Uh, we can prove that there is uh, sort of a unique isomorphism um, by the universal property of localization, but we don't get a path. And also, and this is maybe a bit s a subtle point, and, uh, yeah, uh, if you if you look at when you prove the sheaf property, you stumble on on this ring, which is sort of a ring of double fractions. We first invert f and then g, and we need the fact that this is the same really as inverting f times g. Um, so this we can also get with univalence uh, by applying our function SIP that I showed you earlier. Um, but it should be said that things are not that obvious if you look at the details. So in particular, the, the lean MathLib team, when they, when they formalized things, they were not convinced that even though you have these things, they would solve all your problems. Um, and, and they found that, uh, they, they write in their paper, uh, however, univalence has not solved the problem, the lion's share of the work is still, uh, still needs to be done. Basically arguing that, well, you can get a path, but if you look at the proof, you sort of need to keep track of the isomorphism and how it acts on these double fractions. So you don't get much from it. But what we want to uh, say is that we can use a neat algebraic trick and actually do 
get univalence to do some heavy lifting for us. So the idea is that we can factor the structure sheaf through the type of R algebra. So localizations are R algebras in a canonical way. And um, once we observe that, then it's a standard commutative algebra textbook exercise to prove that this inequality holds if and only if there's a unique morphism of R algebras between the localization. And I've written it up in a more univalent way, maybe, using, so we, we can say this type is contractible. And when we combine this with univalence, we get the following fact. Uh, if, if d of f and d of g are equal up to path, then sort of this path type of localizations is contractible. And uh, what we found out is that is what we actually need. So we couldn't even do the construction I was showing you earlier without this assumption of contractibility. Uh, it was quite crucial. And uh, especially this line lets us avoid all the cumbersome diagram chases that they were afraid of in the lean paper uh, using univalence. So to sum up, our, our uh, formalization, or the outline thereof I presented today, uses a synthetic description of the Zariski lattice. Otherwise, it follows the uh, textbook strategy, sending df to r localized at f, and elaborates it a bit, makes it more clear what we actually need to check that this goes through. And yeah, with this simple algebraic observation, we can get univalence to do some he heavy lifting sort of out of the box as soon as we want to construct a sheaf that sort of maps to elements that have sort of the same properties as localizations, we, we, can, we can do that. And uh, maybe last word about what needs to be done still. So we have to finish the formalization, of course. Uh, once that is done, this, this equality, which is usually a sanity check, so we want to check that O maps D of 1, which is the top element in our lattice, to the ring R. And Hopefully we get schemes in general, or spectral schemes, which is the right constructive notion, and then do projective schemes as a special case. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So... I'd like to know uh, when you used your uh, rings mm -hmm. and uh, when you defined your path between uh, one ring and another mm -hmm. or the localization of one ring to a localization mm -hmm. of another ring, did you actually formalize what a ring morphism is, a oh, morphism yeah. of rings are? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, maybe if I go all the way back. Yeah, so this function, SIP, uh, so it uses the, the right notion of an isomorphism of rings, which is, of course, uh, um, an invertible morphism of rings. Uh, and, and sort of that's how, if you look at the cubical actor, li actor library, you have like a lot of algebraic structures, rings, algebras, groups, or whatever, they all come with their uh, notion of morphism and uh, isomorphism and then with a corresponding structure identity principle. This is uh, sort of automated uh, in the library. Um, there's some uh, some code using actors reflection machinery to, to generate this function automatically once you have the right notion of isomorphism here. Uh, this is work by Evan Cavallo. So in, uh, at the end of your talk, you said something about having a synthetic approach to the um, yeah. uh, Zariski uh, yes. space, uh, well, so distributive so lattice. Yeah, so synthetic in the way that uh, our elements of the lattice are not point sets in a topology. But okay. Oh, so yeah. my question was more like there is a presentation of this lattice in terms of uh, like, uh, pres like an algebraic presentation in terms of generators which are these D of F, yes. and then equations yeah. in one paper by Coco and Lombardi. Is yeah. that something that you consider formalizing, the equivalence um, with your definition? Yes. So uh, this is well, this is also the what Joyal did back in the day. So you, you take the free lattice generated by formal symbols D F, and then 
quotient by a bunch of relations. Um, yeah, and and then so in the paper they they use that this is isomorphic to to this lattice. Um, yeah, that would be nice to have to have this as a high inductive type and proof isomorphism of lattices. Maybe yeah, once the main project is done. <laughs> I understand that your formalization ah. <laughs> is not finished, but could you say a word about the size of the code? Like, how does mm -hmm. it compare to existing works that you've cited? Uh, definitely a lot more code. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think it's a bit unfair to compare uh, lines of code in, in an active formalization to Cock or Lean. So. <laughs> um, yeah, hard to say. Also, so if you if you compare it to the Unimath approach, so it, it, I mean, it, it goes much faster if you use Hartron approach for sure. Yeah, because you don't you do all this trickery that you define it on generality to. Is you what you do is you give yourself a uh, you give yourself an open set U, then sort of define the this the the ring corresponding to it in terms of the prime ideals that are in U. Uh, very directly, and yeah, that makes things shorter for sure. Did you show it to Kevin Buzzard? No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I I was also very suggestive with the coloring here, and uh, <laughs> uh, I think if he would be in the audience, I would have to argue for my choice of colors. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Okay, last question. Uh, thank you. So do you use computation uh, in your formalization? Like in uh, any place does the fact that you have a constructive formalization and a proof assistant that uh, satisfies computation and canonicity and all that comes into play? Yeah, there's some, I mean, it's impossible to get that in. There's some subtle points where things sort of reduce to the right thing computationally. Um, yeah, I, I, th I think it can't really be more concrete than that, <laughs> but yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Let's uh, thank the speaker again.